wanted to talk about your involvement with One Tribe, mm -hmm. um, your research, because I'm kind of wanting to get an understanding of how your research has helped uh, with um, anybody dealing with, you know, PTSD, depression, mm -hmm. uh, suicidal thoughts, how that research has helped and what type of research, if there's any new breakthrough research that you've come across that's helped. Well, I, I try to go th about things in, in a systematic manner. So, I mean, w what I mean is I just don't do research for the sake of doing it. You know, there's an end goal. You know, so if it's, you know, reducing suicide, well, then I'm going to sort of investigate everything I can to see what uh, impacts and, and what leads to somebody doing that. And, you know, the, the method I follow is pretty simple. It's just the scientific method. <laughs> you know, it's you go about trying to find find out what the problem is. You can do that in a thousand different ways. You can, you know, do it quantitatively with numbers. You can look at qualitative research. You can, uh, you know, focus groups. You can, you know, read reports that the VA sends out, you know, things like that, you know, because you never know if one outlet may have something that, uh, a way of looking at it or approaching it that I really haven't thought of. Mm -hmm. So a lot of it is, uh, you know, reading in the, the literature and things like that, you know. So really it's one, identify the problem. And then, you know, once you've been able to do that, you know, so for like suicide, it, it's depression, you know, so once we were able to sort of, uh, you know, uh, evaluate that and identify that, then we go in the literature and we say, hey, you know, what works best, you know, in treating depression, what works best in treating, you know, negative emotions. Uh, and once we do that, then we, you know, come up and we have sort of a round table and I talk to other people and say, Hey, this is what I'm thinking. How do you see it? So it's, it, it's not me in a silo. It's mm -hmm. me working with people, you know, throughout the States and, you know, even internationally that, you know, have different opinions and approaches that, you know, maybe I, I just wouldn't have thought about. Mm -hmm. So identify the problem, uh, investigate the solution. You, Whatever the solution is, you test it and then you repeat. Mm. So I mean, I mean that's pretty much you know as easy as it can get distilled. Yeah. And what what type of uh, uh, therapy types of therapy? Because I know there's different types out there to to help deal with it. And you're saying that depression is the number one leader to suicide. What what types of therapies help with that? Well, there, there's many, many, many causes and. Uh, contributors to suicide. So it's not just depression okay. by itself. Okay. It's isolation. You know, it, it, it's a myriad of things. Um, but what what's neat now is people have manualized treatment, you know, so it, it's, you know, somebody comes up with an idea and they uh, maybe like cognitive processing therapy. That That's one approach that, uh, you know, you go write the account, you do that twice. And then, you know, obsessions, uh, you know, five through 12, you talk about X, Y, and Z. So wait, go, let's rewind the co cognitive processing therapy. Right. What's, so, that, what's that? What is that? Um, that is one approach to, you know, treating uh, PTSD. Mm -hmm. So it, it's a manualized approach. It can be done in individual and a group setting. Mm -hmm. um, that's sort of the gold standard along with another one called prolonged exposure. Um, EMDR, That that's uh, a, a neat one. That's where I sort of gravitate to. Mm. So you, you, you've got these approaches that are very uh, manual based. So sometimes the therapist likes it and sometimes they don't. It, it's very rigid in some regards because that's how they've researched it. You know, mm -hmm. they need to have uh, a very cl clear handle on whatever the mechanisms of change are. So they, uh, they've, done that. So cognitive processing therapy, prolonged exposure, they can both be done in groups and individual. Um, so you, you, you have that sort of camp and then you have the other ones who are more eclectic, who sort of like to rip and pull concepts mm. uh, from different approaches. What is cognitive processing? Like, what is that act? Like, how does it differ from like, say, cognitive behavioral therapy? Like, how are they, are they similar or? Well, I, I would think of cognitive behavioral as a very, very large umbrella uh -huh. and you've got many different approaches underneath it. Cognitive processing therapy is one. Yeah. Uh, you know, the presumption with it is that you, uh, you have takeaways from a traumatic event mm -hmm. and a new belief system because of that. And so, pro uh, you're, so basically you're processing the, the trauma, you're acknowledging it, processing it, and then, and then finding ways to cope with it, to move forward. Is that the basic idea of the processing therapy? 
Yes. And okay. I mean, in a very distilled way, it absolutely yeah. is. I mean, there's definitely more to it, but, right. but I mean, that's the general gist of it. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, some providers are, are really against, um, it, they feel like it doesn't give them much wiggle room. It doesn't give them much freedom, you know, to bring in other concepts and things like that. So it's just, it's just one approach from a research point of view. I completely get it. I understand why that is, but you also have to take into account, you know, the individual providers themselves, and some of them like to get very creative. So you're you you have the research, but you're working with the providers that are helping the veterans or the the first responders or whoever your clients are at one tribe, and essentially they have their own kind of style, and you kind of have to like. Mm-hmm. Ed- help educate them or, or at least give them an idea of what's been successful with these types of clients, essentially? Yeah, well, yeah, sure. Absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, at present, we don't have any um, mental health clinicians, but I do have a massive data set that we created and I have different assessments like on depression, anxiety, things like that. Um, so we were able to sort of come up with, uh, you know, the problem child, which is depression. And then, you know, when the counselors were there, the the awesome part was, hey, this is what I'm noticing in the research. Can you tell me clinically, hey, is is are you seeing that? What does that look like for you? So if, you know, the clinician sort of reports something that, you know, is in the literature as well, yeah. well, then, then, you know, yeah, it's in agreement and you can pretty much take it to the bank. I see. Okay. Uh, and then you mentioned, uh, you mentioned EMDR. What is that? That's eye movement, desensitiz- eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. That's an evidence, evidence-based treatment. It's, you know, it, it's right up there with the other manualized approaches. And what the neat part is, based upon what we were um, finding and noticing in the literature and writing up these articles, um, it's depression, but it's also negative emotions. So, you know, there's a questionnaire that um, directly sort of assesses negative emotions. And, you know, uh, a buddy and I, uh, Jose Carbajal from uh, Stephen F. Austin State University, you know, him and I, we sort of got to talking and we were like, well, if negative emotions are the, are the problem child, well, then, you know, what the hell can we do about that? Right. And uh, we, find, we found this questionnaire that looks at the negative emotions. And we sort of just said, well, hey, why don't we just target, you know, the, the affect, the negative emotions itself instead of, you know. Trying to uh, treat what's, it, exactly. right. it's like it, more, more root, I guess, more I, base. That's, yeah, exactly. I mean, that, that's the way I view it. Yeah. Um, and we've been able to sort of field and test that, you know, and we've we found pretty good success. Um, now, if anybody out there in the audience is listening, you know, really to take that to the next level, you know, if if there's any clinicians out there who are EMDR trained, I would love to meet with them, you mm. know, because since we don't have clinicians, I sort of have to go into the community and identify people who are one trained in it, but also competent mm-hmm. um, right. and uh, specifically for vets and first responders, because it's a very, very um unique culture that sure. people need to sort of have an understanding for. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and what exactly does EMDR like entail? You said uh, eye movement. Well, right. right. So you, you, you can have bilateral stimulation. So it could be auditory. It could be um, uh, with your eyes. It could be tactile. You know, in, in the, the general idea is it's just doing what you do in REM sleep, you know, and, and you're dreaming. You know, the, the uh, eyes go back and forth. So it, it's sort of just like uh, an accelerated uh, processing. You know, for me, I, I always tell people it's sort of like therapy on steroids because it, it gets to the deeper, um, uh, the deeper affect, the deeper emotion. And that's not to say it's any better than any of these other approaches. Right. That's just another tool that providers can use. So is, it, is that hypnosis or is it? No, hi, hi, hypnosis would be when you uh, offer sort of like a, a hypnotic suggestion right. and, and you're sort of interjecting things into it. The, the neat thing about EMDR is they're doing the processing on their own. So you, you uh, what we did, we... Uh, basically had them pair the negative emotion, you know, with uh, negative belief. Yeah. And the only wrinkle we did is what they've already, uh, what they did from the beginning, Francine Shapiro is the one who started it. And uh, she, she was looking um, uh, at the eye movements and, and she was putting a, uh, whatever the traumatic event was, you know, they sort of want like a still picture, you know, say, all right, pair, 
pair that picture with the negative belief. And really all we did was come around the back and say, okay, well, what if we were to just pair the emotion with the belief? Mm. And uh, we've had some pretty good success. And uh, we published a paper in the uh, EMDR uh, journal. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's the MDR journal for the International Association uh, down in uh, Austin. And that's... That's my contribution, I guess, to the to the the clinical relevance to sort of what we found. And when, when, like when you and I first started, it's identify the problem, propose a solution, test it, and and repeat. Mm -hmm. And that that's the process that that we're in right now. Nice. So I'm trying to get wrap my head around the the process of like say EMDR. So if I came into a session with a a, a provider who, who was doing EMDR, mm -hmm. what would they what what would they do? Like what, how, run me through like the process of what that would look like uh mm -hmm. because you said it was like dreaming but it's not or like like rapid eye movement right it, it's um the uh it's it's the rapid eye movements and um what the uh clinicians would propose is that uh, you know you're not doing anything different you know than when you're asleep all you're doing is you're awake you know we're providing sort of like an on-ramp to the memory network mm -hmm. itself and it, it really operates on this assumption um of the aip model it's like the accelerated information information processing mm -hmm. and we're just sort of giving the client or the you know the individual a nudge in in the right direction they're the ones dealing um doing the healing they're the ones sort of going where uh, um, where where the uh, the processing take takes them. So like a, it's it's like a uh, when you're bowling, like like we were talking when I first got here. You know, we got young kids. Yeah. When they go bowling, you know, they throw gutter balls. So really, what the clinicians are doing, they're they're putting those guardrails on there, mm. and they're not letting them sort of go in the gutter. How are they putting the guardrails on? Like what like. If, if someone's doing like just basic talk therapy versus like EMDR, what's that look like in a, in a session? Like, what is what are you doing in in an EMDR session? Well, they, I mean, they both have guardrails. Mm -hmm. I mean, the um, when you start doing this trauma informed work or trauma enforced um, uh, processing, really the first thing you want to do is sort of uh, help them down regulate. Mm -hmm. So if if they can't form like a safe place or if they can't sort of self soothe, you want to address that before you hit the trauma because if you hit the trauma and they can't do that they're going to decompensate like crazy mm -hmm. so you, you need to do a lot of front loading and um, with uh, like uh, cognitive processing or some of these other uh, manualized approaches if you had 10 traumatic events in iraq or or you know as a police officer or something like that um w then they want you to really pick the top one and okay. I understand the logic of it. it from a research standpoint. Mm -hmm. It it sort of creates like a cascade effect. So you could probably group those 10, you know, into uh, like items, you know, whether it's uh, an emotion, guilt, or, you know, whatever, you, you can group them. Mm -hmm. So if you hit one, you know, maybe you've got nine left, but all of a sudden you've got six mm -hmm. and then you just repeat the process. The, the thing I love about EMDR is it, it makes a pretty exhaustive list of how um, things were, mm -hmm. you know, past events, present events, and how you want to be in the future. Mm -hmm. And uh, to me, I think that's one of its biggest strengths is it does uh, look at the holistic thing. You're gonna make you're gonna make a list of all the traumatic events that you've gone through, just like anything else. It's gonna create like a cascade effect, mm -hmm. but you still have to go through the process. So you know, if there's ten events, now you've got six all of a sudden then you just repeat mm -hmm. and uh with with emdr the thing that sets it apart is you know it, it's the heavy focus on the individual so, well the, the the theoretical assumption you know of the aip model basically is they go wherever they need to go so the clinician if if the event is you know getting blown up in iraq or something mm -hmm. if if they start talking about their most recent birthday, well, the provider, maybe there's some tie in, but at the same time, maybe that's, you know, uh, completely unrelated. So that would be the guardrails of them uh, coming back online. I see. Uh, and the EM, you said eye movement. Th does that mean when they're in a session, they're having them like blink or what are, what are they doing to with their eyes that 
necessitates no, sure, that name. Sure. So when uh, when Francine Shapiro first started this, she um, she labeled it uh, EMDR. The story goes, she was walking through the park. She noticed, you know, her eyes moving back, you know, back and forth, and she um, she felt a little bit calmer. Mm. So she was in a PhD English program. She completely shifted and moved to psychology. Mm. Um, she she recently passed, but um, you you you're going to make a whole list of the the event. You know, so you're going to do the self soothing. You're going to make an exhaustive list. Then you're going to sort of have a collaborative discussion with you know the client mm -hmm. a, as far as okay, the, you know, this is the list that we had. You know, where do we want to go? You know, you know, what's the the method to the madness? Mm -hmm. So whether it's clinically or research, I'm I'm not a fan of just sort of like floating around. Mm -hmm. You know, there needs to be a very um, detailed uh, plan of how to uh, address things. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, in in the set when it, when it first started, um, it was uh, eye movements, and the, the I think the first study was in '89, and it was on Vietnam veterans. Mm -hmm. Um, I won't get on my soapbox, but we, we owe them a ton. Yeah. Um, and uh, so it started with that. And then um, people came along uh, along the way and they um, they said, well, heck, if the eye movements do it, you know, other, you know, whether it's auditory or tactile, um, those will work. And like, a, like a tick, some sort of thing that you do regularly, like whether it's like tapping your hands or like. Well, that, or that's the neat part. So if, if you're a provider, you can, when you go through the training, they say, well, you can tap them on the knees, you know, or you can sort of give them like a, a, some a little nods that they can hold in their, their hands that sort of vibrate back and forth. Uh, okay. So, so basically like a constant stimulus of some sort that's physical. So that's like not stop. That's not stopping. It, 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 exactly. Okay. And, and th this is why, uh, the treatment plan is so, so important. Right. Um, you could do some weird stuff. <laughs> it, well, it, 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 no, <laughs> you're, no, you're, 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 yeah. you're absolutely right. Yeah. And it, it, it's, it's neat because they're doing the healing on their own. Some of these other manualized approaches, it, it's it's very rigid. E EMDR does have that, but it's a little bit, people have a little bit more creativity. They, mm -hmm. ha they have more um, more room to sort of, you know, add their personal touch to it. So, you know, when, when you're in a uh, counseling session, you can, um, they're Neurotech, it's a company out of Colorado. They produce light bars. They you know, uh, you know, uh, a clinician could sort of press a button and then it, you know, this light bar sort of goes back and forth. Oh, okay. So that, that's similar. Um, when, when it first started, you know, they would sort of do eye movements like that. Uh -huh. So I would say, Hey, um, you know, follow my fingers, mm. but, but the, 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 the thing that I would have you do would be, okay. The, the most traumatic image of getting blown up was, uh, seeing the car wreck or something like that. And then I would pair the negative thought with that, mm. and um, then I would sort of turn on the bilateral stimulation and um, let the client sort of go where they go. And that's that's what I wow, like about it. That's really cool because, like you said, there's there's more more methods of, of transport that could be that could work. Like you said, auditory as well. So you could have like two pulses of sound going. Yeah, doo, doo, you have doo. headphones that just go back bi and like forth. Bi binaural beats, kind of a thing. Like uh, yeah, kind roughly, of, roughly, uh, yeah. yeah, okay. Um, what about strobe? Is it similar to like the strobe too? Like strobes that kind of flash kind of thing or? So, so there, there are, um, some approaches where if like, if you had a light bar sort of like, you know, just like a, a long rectangle, well, there's little lights that sort of, you know, so when it goes left, it, mm -hmm. it's time sync. Mm -hmm. There, there's also ones that, you know, it's just left, right, left, right. Mm -hmm. You know, whereas some are, um, you know, they, they, they they fully go left and right as opposed to just that's really interesting because there's it, like you said it opens the door to a lot of different avenues for for research and experimentation right. have you found within that emdr uh any of the specific methods to be more but that work seem to work better that have like whether it's like you know follow my fingers or let's use the light bars or anything that you found or that you based on the research that points well, the, um that that's where um that, that's why I like it so much. So when somebody comes in and, and they're uh, meeting, meeting with the counselor, they, they sort of practice, they do like a dry run. So they, they would pick something super, you know, not uh, stressful. So uh, did the kid, like, like we were saying, did the kids, you know, track in mud in the house, you know, something very, very um, 
small that really wouldn't activate it. So then, then you do dry run and, and you identify what, um, what works best for that client. You know, some people with, uh, ADHD, they prefer to close their eyes and sort of, um, you know, feel the, the vibrating or, or hear it. Mm. Other, other people, for whatever reason, they like, you know, they like the light bars, but then on the flip side, you've got some counselors, you know, who have found more sort of like ana anecdotal success, you know, with, uh, you know, one of the modes of delivery and they prefer that. I see. But it, it it's, it's just a collaborative informal discussion with the client before right. you get there. So the client, you basically try them out on like a dry run when they're, it's nothing that's kind of something that's kind of innocuous. And then if they feel comfortable with that process and then they don't feel like yep. that that's distracting, then you can go start with that and, and, and try with that method. And then, and yep. then if you're like, okay, this is working pretty well. Let's try another one just to see if it works better. And then you can, you can try different methods essentially. Yeah. And, yeah. and e even if you get stuck, you know, so if uh, you're the counselor, I'm your client coming in, you know, I love the, you know, the tactile things. Well, if I'm sort of looping and I'm not making much progress, yeah. you know, then you have the option. Okay, you're stuck. So, you know, let's, you know, go to a different approach, you yeah. know, so then we would do the eye movements. Yeah. So there, there are tricks to the trade and that would, that would be discussed beforehand. Okay. You know, client likes, uh, you know, the tactile, but if we get into, uh, if we get stuck, well, then we can you know, try a different mode of delivery. Mm, that's really interesting. That's really cool. You mentioned earlier um, that, um, that, you know, you had the depression was the big, the big factor that kind of led to the suicidal thoughts and ideations, but then also uh, be below that, the kind of like the more root cause would be the negative thoughts uh, that would kind of lead to that. Right. Essentially. Uh, well, that that's an interesting statement. Um, you, you have uh, some camps, some people saying that, you know, well, you have the thought first and then, you know, you have the emotion that, you know, is a consequence of that. Right. Um, from what I've learned and, and I, I won't try to make too much of a declarative statement, but I, I'm in the camp that I believe that it's the emotions that drive the thoughts, you know? So if, if, if mm. it's the thoughts of suicide, well, you know, is it, what's the narrative around the emotion? You know, what are the thoughts? Your, per your perception of the emotion. Exactly. Yeah, right. So I'm, uh, guilt, guilt is a, a perfect ex example. Um, I always explain it to people um, just, like the, just like the cowboys. It, it, they're never going to change, you know? So <laughs> Sunday they lose. It, it's just, Come it's on, just man. unbelievable. Man. Uh, they, they need like a whole mental health disorder just for people who. It, Cowboys it's gonna, fans. Yeah. yeah it's, no, as long as Jerry Jones is around, it's yeah. not going to. Yeah, yeah. Right. That's, that's, that's the consensus, I think. Um, so yeah, you'll have to pull me back. Mm. Um, so I'm, I'm of the opinion that it, it's emotions first. And, you know, with, with the small little EMDR wrinkle that, that we did, um, and what I read in the literature, when I was doing the qualitative interviews with, the, with those three, it was matching up like crazy. And it, it was, it was almost un unbelievable. Yeah. And, um, for, I mean, you've got veterans, you've got first responders, you've got civilians, you've, You've got people exposed to trauma, and I do believe that it is the you know the affect slash negative emotions that sort of precede the the thoughts or the narrative around that. Right, it's kind of a chicken versus the egg kind of kind right. of right kind of dilemma. Um, I'll sp I'll speak anecdotally. I would say that um, I definitely agree with how you how I perceive. I've been really getting really good at observing my thoughts and observing negative thoughts when they come in. And I think there's, there's a huge stat, like 65% of people have, uh, sorry, 65% of the time people are having negative thoughts when they're thinking. So 65% of their thoughts have a negative connotation towards, towards it. And I'm not sure if that's the correct step, but that's what I remember. Um, and so I think about how you observe your thoughts and how you label them as say negative or positive. And if those compound, if you have a negative mind, uh, negative mindset and by nature, I think we do because it's our like survival defense mechanism. If you have that in nature, by nature, and then you acknowledge that and are able to say, okay, this is me thinking neg negatively, and then you don't let that emotion kind of attach to that thought, then it won't compound into something that can turn you down a dark alley, you know, that mentally, you know? So I definitely know, I definitely agree or, or, or think similarly that it's like how you perceive the emotion mm -hmm. and how you kind of connect to it 
that's going to decide whether or not that's going to compound and then turn into something that could that could be bad later on, you know, uh, emotionally. Your vernacular is very interesting because you said compound three times. Mm. And that's key because you, you have the emotion, then you have the thought that sort of swirls around that. Mm -hmm. And if it's a negative thought, it compounds the problem right. and it reinforces what you're trying um what you're trying to solve. Yeah, it's like a cycle. It's like a vicious cycle that compounds. That's why cuz I personally dealt with that. So I think that you no know, being able to acknowledge it and and see it and is is the first, you know, is the first step. But I think that's really useful the 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 EMDR. I mean, I, I have a, th a therapist that I see for just CBT and he's helped me a lot. But I think the I've never tried or looked into the the physical tactile part and that's really interesting. Mm -hmm. I can see how uh, attributed. I, I've did a tiny bit of research on like what was called uh, tapping, mm -hmm. you know, um, and and it, it's shown, you know, promise, but I've never dove, dove into it and tried it with like- Same a principle. Pro yeah, right. Y you know, and and what what you're saying in, in regard to um, how, how, how your, your mindset. So, you know, when, when, when the emotion comes up, well, what, what do you do? How, you know, how do you deal with it? Yeah. You know, and what you said was neat because if generally if people have, you know, an open mindset, they are, you know, able to sort of look at it. But if somebody's already closed off and then you have more negative stuff piled upon that, yeah. that compounds the problem. And, you know, I, maybe a, a, a good example would be if you need to get a new roof on your house and you're, you're doing your research, you know, with company one, two, and three, well, if company three, they've got like 58 awesome five-star reviews, but they've got two negative ones that are taking them to task. Right. We put more weight in, in those two. For sure. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. On the negative. Absolutely. Um, I think that, um, uh, when people uh, who are closed off, like you said, mm -hmm. a lot of times, and I'll speak this for myself, but I think it, it's not, it's just purely out of, out of pure ignorance it, and, and it's not in a negative way. It's like, you just don't know. Exactly. It's exactly. mindfulness is, is cultivated because you just get practice at observing your thoughts when they enter and you exactly. get good at saying, okay, I'm thinking something bad. Let me acknowledge and let me acknowledge this. Let me think. And this is something that's taken me years to kind of acknowledge. Cause I think so much of my negative thought patterns were just, and most people's negative thought patterns are just instinctive. It's yep. like, it's part, it's your condition. So from a, from an early age, even if you had a great childhood, there's certain things that are in there that you are automatically go towards the negative in your head. And so if you're able to, uh, acknowledge that and just observe. And so that mindfulness, I think is such a huge thing that, that cultivating mindfulness and wisdom, just being able to, to look at your thoughts, so whether or not, you know, sometimes it's really hard if you're like in a, in a dark space to be able to look at those thoughts and, and be objective about what you can do to change it and better it. Cause you kind of in a loop, but just having that capacity to acknowledge it in the first place is like the first step. And I think a lot of people have a not, not only have a hard time doing it, but don't even know how to do it in the first place. There's a, there's a lot of overlap in, yeah. in w what you were saying. Um, not purists may disagree, but I guess in, in general terms, the, the way I would say it is, you know, you, you have an open mind, but also at the same time, you could say, call it mindfulness. Right. Um, but th there, there, there's a concept called post-traumatic growth. And w what, what they argue is that, um, you go through a traumatic event and and you can grow, you know, so it, it, you can stay the same and get worse or get better. Mm. And the, the ones who can sort of thrive after that, you know, I, so you could call it being resilient as well. Right. Um, th those people have, an, they're, they keep looking for um, outlets. And for me, the way I live my life is um, I just keep my feet moving. So if I'm in a tough spot, just don't stop moving. You don't, you don't know if, you know, you'll figure it out next hour or next day or next week. Right. But if you keep going, mm. you will find it eventually. And right. it's that open-mindedness and resilience that, um, that some people can thrive and, and, and some people need a little bit more of a nudge. Yeah. Cause a lot of times that, uh, that would cause people to 
want to quit and curl up into a ball rather than keep going. Right. Right. You know, if it's, if there's, there's no results or there's no, there's no progress or, you know, like what am I doing? And then it causes you to regress versus just continuing. So that's a good mindset to have just to keep on trucking kind of thing. I've, for whatever reason, I've gotten on YouTube lately and I've, I, I like, um, you know, looking at, at sort of extremes. And one of those would be the special operations, um, units and, you know, some of the elite of the, the SAS, Delta, still team six, uh, PJs, they, when they're going through the selection, what they most commonly say is you would have to pull me off of this mountain before I don't finish this road march, mm -hmm. or you're going, you're going to physically have to do it because there is no quit in, in me. Mm. And I, 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 while that's an extreme example, I, I think even just civilians like you and I can still cut and paste that idea, you know, and, and, you know, apply it to our private or professional lives. All right. Well, you are a veteran. Right. So, so you have that kind of mindset kind of ingrained in you, which probably makes it more natural than say somebody who hasn't served. Right. I would imagine because you've, it's been trained and it's been part of your culture and life since you were, you know, what, and when did you, uh, did you enlist or were you an officer or? Oh no, no, I worked for a living. Okay. <laughs> um, no, I, I went in from 04 to, uh, 07. Okay. Uh, I was enlisted. I got out as a E5 Bucks Arden. Okay. And we, we did go to, um, we just did so, go. Wait, just so anybody watching, there's who, I don't know why nobody would know this, but we have E's and O's <laughs> enlisted okay. and officers keep going. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, so the, uh, the officers are the ones who uh, sort of manage and the enlisted are sort of the ones who get things done. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, we, we were in Iraq and I told everybody joining the army or joining the military was the best professional decision I ever made. It has opened up every single door that I've had um, since then. Mm. And, you know, in the, in, in the army, they, they have tons of resilience training you know, so they do provide some of this information, but at the same time, you have individual differences. Sure. You have, maybe you had a much different upbringing than I did, which will affect the way you, you look at life. Right. So I, I think people need to drastically change the, the way they conceptualize resilience because, and some of the articles, um, well, maybe I should back up. Mm. Um, uh, so... I do have sort of internal job duties that I do have to do, but once those are handled, then I can sort of look in the literature. I can start playing with the numbers and I've got literally like eight, 18, 20 assessments, you know, that we've given over the years. And when, when I, when I look at that and I try to compare vets first, first responders, it, it's light years difference. Really? Um, so, and it, that's, that's, I'll, that's I'll, I'll, I won't go into the stats and and well, stuff. it'd be cool. To, some, some school stuff would be interesting if you if you don't if you don't mind. If there's anything cool that comes off the top of your head, feel free to share because that's really interesting to me. Okay, yeah. well, um, I I would um, you have your normal analytical like latent variable approaches, um, but there's one called network analysis that I absolutely love, and I I, I love it. it's beautiful because you you can put you know, all 22 questions of the resilience assessment uh, in there. And it, it, it creates a picture of, okay, what are the things most connected and what are the things not most connected? Oh, so there's a test for, res a test for resilience. Well, yeah, there's, okay. well, yeah, there's, there's many, many, many questionnaires and assessments that yeah. people have come up with over the years. Uh, well, and, and even if you look at some of the, the different questionnaires, they have drastically different assumptions right. that, that go with them. Um, so, so that's a caveat, but with, um, first responders specifically, um, there are tricks you can do with data. So even if I give a whole bunch of people the same, um, questionnaires, but don't track it over time, there's tricks where you can do to say, okay, even though this is cross-sectional, you can still argue what happens first, what happens second, yada, yada, yada. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, suicide. Um, what it was in, it was in a directed acyclic graph is the the nerd term for it. Um, and in, resilience was independent of PTSD, uh, depression, and and all of that. So, but it was right above suicide. 
So what exactly? So what what that tells me is resilience wasn't above anxiety or uh, you know any of the other constructs we had in that in that model. Really, what it was, it was um, specifically above suicide. So it got applied as needed, and that's the way I view resilience now. So when you say uh, above suicide, was that means it, what does that mean? Specifically? Uh, it preceded it. Okay. Put, put it, you know, basically to to prevent somebody from doing kill, harming themselves, that that resilience would prevent them from doing that. Is that what you mean? Yep, exactly. I said, okay. And it, it was independent of de- uh, depression, anxiety, PTSD, uh, and and all of that. Mm-hmm. So it, it it wasn't over here on like you know an emotion thing or yeah. anxiety. It was right where it needed to be, right above. Uh, suicide, which kind of makes sense, you know, because it's it's a as a survival resilience re- is required for survival, essentially, right? Everything makes sense once you have the data. <laughs> so, so I, I I work with you know a lot of people all over the globe. I I think you know the internet's amazing because I've been able to sort of um, reach out to people and collaborate and things like that. So for first responders, th- that's why resilience training is absolutely necessary because it was right above suicide. It was right where it needed to be. And that shows you that re- resilience training for first responders is needed. Mm-hmm. No questions asked. Mm-hmm. Um, within the last two weeks, I have a buddy from Canada and uh, he ran one for veterans and it didn't shake out. So it it did not, the, the, the order of events, you know, of what happens first, you know, the emotions and then um, that, he he ran it. Now I'll give him credit. His name's Blake Boheim. He's from uh, Canada. He's, he was in Afghanistan. Wicked smart. Um, but for veterans, it looks different. Yeah. So even though these are both two trauma exposed populations, resilience looks drastically different for for both. Is it probably because the vets already have such a such are are trained to have such resilience <laughs> from the get go? Possibly that that my bet. Don't don't take this to the bank, but right, you know an informal statement would be: um, first responders are currently first responders. The ones who have come to you know my organization that was sometimes years or maybe a decade after the war. Right. So they're filling something out mm-hmm. that you know we would try to superimpose on their deployment all those years ago. Right. So I I, I think it's the um, it's like a past life. They're not living that anymore. Right. So, yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. But but that's where that that's what led us to sort of argue and believe that. Um, and, and we read that I'm not some quack who's just coming on here to blow V8 and, and you know, all of that, all the stuff that we've done, it's in peer reviewed journals. So that means colleagues have evaluated it and their consensus has been like, okay, it's good enough. We believe what they're saying is accurate. And then um, they, they, they publish it. But um, the thing that really for first responders was important for resilience was um, finding opportunities for growth. Mm -hmm. So this is where the post-traumatic growth and resilience, they, they sort of merge. Mm -hmm. So you were saying mindfulness. I mean, so Oh, uh, you know, mindfulness, op- being open-minded. Right. I mean, th- these are all different ways of really sort of getting at the core similarity in my, in my opinion. Right. You have to be, you have to be open to suggestion and change if you want to change, <laughs> you know, you have to be open to it. And I think that that is required for anybody to want to make a change for the better in themselves. Right. But if 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 you're a veteran and you had stuff happen overseas that really wasn't the most ideal, some of them blame the government. Right. So they're not going to go to the government, you know, i.e. the VA. Um, so I think that community community clinics, whether it's a nonprofit and LLC, I think that's that's where they can sort of plug a, a hole. Yeah. So I, I think these people might be a little bit more inclined to come to uh, an entity that's not formally with the federal government. Right. And especially one tribe, which is made up of veterans. So it's like, you know, people, you know, brothers that you, that, yep. you, that they know, Oh, this is my family. I can, I kind of feel safe. You'll, you'll be more inclined to open up and, and have an open mind as opposed to just going to like, you know, the, the VA or something like that, you know, the, the hospital. Well, yeah. And then we're real big on why, 
you know, why do you want to, uh, you know, do research? Why do you want to work in an organization like that? Somebody doesn't have to be a veteran. They don't have to be a first responder or be related in any way, shape or form um, to, to be passionate about it. But right. sometimes it helps with cultural competence. Sure. And, and, and well, you can like, relate like, exactly. you, yeah, for sure. Exactly. I mean, you, well, so how is your experience being a veteran, uh, impacted your work with one tribe? Cause you, I mean, obviously you could have gone off and done private work with people who outside of the, you know, outside of veterans and first responders, but I'm sure that that mindset and having had that experience in the military has helped you directly with, you know, clients and, and the research and probably motivated you to, to do the more research, right? I guess I'll get on my soapbox. Yeah. Um, the, the, the Vietnam veterans in, 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 in my opinion. So I worked at the VA for like eight, eight, nine ish years. Um, and I, I firmly believe that the Vietnam veterans are the most misunderstood group of people in all of American history. Um, we owe them a lot. I owe them a lot because, um, the way that society is right now about, bending over backwards for veterans, that's in a direct result, in my opinion, as to why they were treated the way they were, you know, and it, it wasn't good. If you could design, it was a, like a rebound effect because of how they were treated back then. Yeah. Well, the, yeah. The, the way society is, you know, I, when they would touch down uh, at Travis air force base in California, after they get out of Vietnam, there would be people spitting on them outside the chain link Wow, yeah. Some some of them would um, get uh, changed into civilian clothes, and they wouldn't talk about the war for 30, 40 years. Oh man, and that's uh, a recipe for for disaster for yourself. No, it, for sure. it absolutely is. But we the the mental health community n noticed how it affected them. So I mean, if I love military history, you know, and and studying all the wars that we've been in, but I, I think that, um, you know, they could be in a firefight on Friday and they could be discharged on Sunday, you know, flying into DFW to go to Dallas, you know? So nowadays we have a, a, a process set up. You have to do these briefings before you get out, yada, 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 you know? Uh, but, but the mental health community, they, they recognized it. And it wasn't until 1980 mm. that PTSD became an official diagnosis. And that's, in my opinion, directly because of them. Mm -hmm. And I think two of the, two of the things I always mention, uh, we, when, when, when I talk about this, one is the Vietnam wall in Washington, DC. It's not on a prime piece of real estate. It it's, it's in a place where if you're not looking for it, you're not going to find it. Mm. Um, so that's one. And two is agent orange. Mm. That's, um, have you heard? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. But, but please. So a Agent Orange is, it's a defoliant that we used um, in, in Vietnam to... Defoliant is a, a gas, right? Or a spray? I believe so, yes. Okay. Um, I've slept since I read it. Um, so, so yeah, it, it's a solution or herbicide, whatever the word. Yeah. You know, it, it's a defoliant that gets rid of the canopy in the trees so that we can see. Well, we, maybe we did, maybe we didn't, but we, uh, we used it in a wide degree. And, um, I've got one person that, uh, that stuck with me. He, he said that when he was a medic, it was a corpsman in, in Vietnam. And he was saying whenever they would spray it, he didn't trust it. So he would get under his poncho, uh, while it was coming down. The only part of his hand body that was exposed was his hands. Mm -hmm. And what do you know? 40 years later, that's where he gets cancer. Wow. Um, That's fucked up, man. But it didn't, things didn't shift. So there was an admiral, I think his name was Zumwalt. Um, he he was in charge of uh, the, the naval thing in Vietnam, I think from like 68 to 71. Um, but very, very long story short, uh, his son served in Vietnam and his son died in 1988 because of Agent Orange. It was the following year, that's when Congress really stepped it up and they started legislation and they started studying it. Wow. That's I, what it takes. It takes a powerful, somebody in power and so, for it to happen to them directly for, for change to happen. 
I'll, I'll let people draw their own sure. con conclusions for all I'll say is the timing is extremely interesting. Right. So th what they, you know, those are just two examples of it at scores, you know, endless ones. And society, I think learned from that and what the v the Vietnam veteran sort of benefited from Iraq because, or the post nine 11 wars, because it, it sort of drummed stuff up and it led them to start saying, okay, maybe there's something going on with me. Maybe I need to go talk to somebody, um, uh, things like that. So veterans have been studied a lot and the way I view first responders, but specifically the, uh, the law enforcement, uh, officers, the, the police officers, they, the way they are getting treated right now, mm -hmm. it r really pissed me off. Um, and it, it made me mad because it's exactly how the Vietnam guys were treated. It's not fair. Yeah. Sure. That, you know, just there, there's good police, bad police. There's good EMTs, bad EMT, you know, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But they're, they're being smeared for, for, I'll watch my words. They're, they're being smeared right now and I'm not a fan of it. Yeah. So everything that I've done in the last couple of years has been, um, specifically for first responders. And one of the stuff like this has been happening my whole life. I don't understand why, but our office was in downtown uh, Fort Worth. And in January of 2020, uh, I was told, hey, there's a briefing at uh, the, the criminal court building. They want to start a first responder court program. Well, well, you know, what the heck is that? So I, I go to the, to the uh, briefing and uh, me and a colleague, Janine Galusha, she's a, she was a former police officer. She's a, uh, she's a forensic neuropsychologist. Her brain's like a freaking computer. <laughs> it, it's, it's not even fun. So we, we agreed to um, uh, evaluate the, the court program. So the, the backstory is in the song, in 2017, the Texas legislature said, Hey, um, we're, we're going to pass this court program and we're going to leave it up to the counties to see who wants to implement it. Mm -hmm. And this is a direct cut and paste of the veteran treatment court. The, have you heard of it? Mm -mm, no. Okay. So the veteran treatment court, I, I think it started in Albany, New York. Um, so if, if I get arrested for, uh, like a drug or a alcohol related offense, well, they, they have, um, drug court, they have things that specifically, target that just like domestic violence. Uh, I can't, what, what, whatever, whatever the, the similarity of the crime is, they have a specialty court for that. I see. So the, the, the veterans were coming back and they were having tons of run-ins, uh, with, with the police. And th this, this was very, 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 uh, common after the civil war, after, after every war, even Vietnam. Um, so they stood up this court program and they, said, if you're a veteran and you get arrested, I'll just go generic. So if you're a veteran, you get arrested for a DUI, um, you can apply to this court. So if, if you get accepted, well, then you do whatever the requirements are, counseling, AA, uh, victim impact panel. If you do that, you have good behavior, you stay clean. When you graduate the program, uh, we're going to erase it off your record. So it's as if you didn't even have a DUI. Mm. Now, obviously like like character or character logical things like uh, you going to rob a bank or, you know, something like that. And eh, that's not what the program's for, right. you know? Um, so the, the first one in the nation for first responders is in Fort Worth. Mm. And um, you've got like 254 counties in Texas. You've got about 3,100 counties and parishes in America. And it just so happened to be the first one is in Fort Worth. Right. You know? So when, when I go to this, uh, briefing. I meet um, Janine. I, you know, the judge gets up and talks, and I, I, I think this is where where things got interesting. You know, the judge has one very interesting background. He was a uh, police officer for like ten years. He was a certified EMT firefighter. Uh, he's even in the guard right now as like a colonel. So it's like you know, this dude's doing in like 20, 30 years what most you know, couldn't in, in several lifetimes. Right. Um, so he volunteered to, to do this program and, um, it, it, it's the same concept. It's, it's a literal cut and paste. And 
I I I was really excited about it because, you know, some of the some of these people that have to deal with trauma, these you know firefighters, EMTs, and police officers, they, it impacts them drastically. I mean, we can get into that later if you want, but um, they they deal with they have diff- very different roles and responsibilities sure. and um, uh, ways they interact with the public. Absolutely, and that can have an impact on them, and maybe they get a DUI. Mm-hmm. So you know, the assumption with the court program is. You've had some trauma at work, so we're going to sort of cut of cut you a break. You, if you get admitted to the program, you do what you're told, and you graduate, then you can sort of go back and resume, uh, you know, being a uh, police officer. Because for them, uh, the, uh, their livelihood's a big thing, you know. And if they get their um, weapon taken away for whatever reason, well, it, they really can't continue. Right. You know, in their given profession. So this is a hell of an opportunity for them to sort of do some introspection and see what's going on um, and um, graduate the program and apply the principles. Is this a program that uh, <laughs> would the police officers or our first responders have to have committed some sort of offense to go there? Or is it something that they can go out of their own volition to look for help? Or how does it work as far as joining? Well, so I guess when we started, I, if I go long winded, tell me, um, I've, I've, I've looked at, um, the continuum of like a first responders career. So at the very beginning, you, you know, you've got the police academy, you've got the, you know, this initial training and then, you know, then you do your career. Well, once you get into, you know, several years into your, uh, career, the things start to take a toll on you okay. and uh, not everybody comes and seeks counseling. Mm-hmm. Um, I've, I've done articles that look at uh, police officers who are in therapy versus not. And the same thing for EMTs and long story short, everybody who's seeking treatment, their depression, their anxiety, the suicide, it's, it's markedly higher in the ones that uh, are seeking treatment that are seeking. Right. Treatment. Oh, so okay. I, I've, I've, done projects where we've collected data on ones who are not in therapy. And, you know, so we just come, they had the exact same scales and and we looked at it and the, so the ones who are not in treatment, they under report the living hell out of everything. Right. Because kind of what we were just talking about. So this court program, this is at the extreme. This is for the people who, who did have a distinguished career they it just took a toll on them. Mm-hmm. So if we can get people to do a little bit of prevent preventive maintenance, that's what I want to do, mm-hmm. and that that's my goal. So everything I've done in the last two two and a half years has been uh, <clears throat> in regard to writing up this last article for uh, the court program, and I, I should have started by saying it's the public employees treatment court. Mm-hmm. Uh, the public employees treatment court, they can put it in Google and uh, the, the county's got a website for it. Um, this needs to be, you know, nationwide. There's absolutely. absolutely no reason. So if there's any first responders, if there's any, uh, if there's anybody out there, <clears throat> uh, retired people, any activists, anything like that, that could be a mover and a shaker in their local community. I think this is where they could really step up and, and uh, contribute. Yeah. Yeah, I think the hard the hard part for a lot of for this initiative is for people who for first responders who haven't passed who haven't been past that threshold that breaking point where right. they feel like I need I need help uh, recognizing and being aware of this is a resource that I need to use before right. it becomes a problem. I think the educating people and not just first responders but people in general right, right? knowing like okay <laughs> things aren't aren't going well I need to it's you know kind of like you got a mole getting it checked out by the doctor before right. it turns into something too bad. And like having that preventative mindset approach is definitely one of those things that's probably hard for a lot of people. And then if I had the answer, I'd, I'd have a podcast. <laughs> yeah. Right, I'd, right. I'd be the one running my mouth. Because, sure. I mean, if somebody can substance, substantively figure this out, uh, they're, they're, they're going to get a lot of, um, Recognition for yeah. It for sure. Well, I was thinking money. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so if somebody can figure this out and then market it, yeah. well, I mean that's a hell of a uh, a, a thing. Yeah. But what? So the, everything's been in regard to this initial court article. Yeah. And showing that it works. It does. It reduced 
anxiety, depression, suicide, it, it reduced everything. Um, and it increased their uh, resilience. So what I want to do next is people do research in silos, and I'm not a fan of, of that at all. And what I mean is if you, uh, you live in Georgia and, uh, you know, you're, you, well, better yet, I'll, I'll give a, an actual example. Uh, Anka Vuch, I, I, Vuch, I, I don't even know how to pronounce her name. She She's at... Um, Texas A&M, she, she did a data collection in, I think, 2018, 2019 of the fire department down there. And she's got a massive data set. And she, she's a full-time, you know, professor. She's, you know, doing research. She's doing all of this. You know, she's got a data set that needs to be explored, just, just like I do. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you could be in Georgia and you're you know, you've collected your own data, but you don't have the time to analyze it. Mm -hmm. So what I want to do, my, everybody's got a role. I, I think this is my small contribution that I can make, you know, to the movement is try to organize, you know, this and, and figure it out. Yeah. And, 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 you know, well, does suicide look different for police in Dallas than Jackson, Mississippi? Yeah. If, Some sort of network that can be, sh where information can be shared so that it can be analyzed by Scientific, exactly. The scientific exactly. community in that field, yeah, and and uh, you know, I, I get a lot of my ideas from reading what other people have wrote. And there's a there's a website called ResearchGate. It it or you know, you go to LinkedIn. It's sort of like, uh, it's a place for nerds, I guess. You know, so you know, people who uh, you can follow people. Keep, and, going. Keep going. I'm just gonna check the cameras. Um, people can, um. There you go, bam. Um, so uh, with with ResearchGate, um, you can follow P. If I like you, write something that I love. I can follow you, and anything you write, I can get a notification of. Well, long story short, there was a lady from uh, the United Arab Emirates of all, of all places, you know, and uh, I, I'm doing the she she's a former EMT. It's at uh, Ajman University. It's like 50 miles southeast of Dubai. I'm going to go there in probably early February. But we're going to start a nationwide data collection of EMTs in Saudi Arabia. That's great. So That's we're huge. Gonna, especially well, we're we're going to use the same, the same damn assessment. Yeah. So whether it's Georgia, Mississippi, or you know, M Middle East, if, if we can establish that things are the same, that makes our life so much easier. For sure, for sure. I doubt that's going to be the case, you, you know, but, but th that's what I mean. You're going to need, you're going to need wrinkles. You're going to need cultural competence. I don't have all the answers. I no, understand I, the veteran literature because I lived it, yeah. but I've never been a first responder. So I need to surround myself with former first responders that yeah. I can bounce ideas off of. No, I think you're right. I think this is my perception. And again, I'm not a scientist, but this is just based off my perception is that because of the public perception and stigma that have that has affected pl American police officers yep. and first responders yep. in the last few years with you know BLM and, and you know Antifa, all this whatever stuff, you know, <laughs> the media, um, I think that has probably played a large role, just like it did in Vietnam for the vets yep. in their in how they in that threshold of them not wanting to come up, not not wanting to come up yep. for help, even though because you feel unappreciated as a police officer if your if your goal is you go in every day trying to save lives and you've got people online metaphorically spitting on you yep. and you're like, what? or literally, or literally you're like, what is, what, why am I doing this job? I, it's a thankless job and I'm, I'm risking my life every day <laughs> to do this. You're going to, it's going to, that, that's going to play a toll on you quickly. And I'd imagine that, uh, on other parts of the world where this isn't a thing or an issue, they're not dealing with these same problems. And that, that, that's what, that's, what's going to be so interesting. Right. You know, I, I mean, so like I was saying, you've got the first responders in therapy versus not, we've established that the ones who are seeking therapy, their self report on everything is higher than the ones not in therapy. Mm -hmm. So cool. Um, now we, now we need to really just compare and contrast, you know, Middle East, Europe, you know, anywhere in between. Yeah. But, but what I want to do is create like a, I don't know if a task force is the right word, um, but I, I want to create a database of people who have first responder data sets mm -hmm. so that we can go about this in a systematic manner because people, uh, people, I'm not a fan of it, but a lot of people, um, they keep their data close to the chest. 
They don't like sharing it. To me, I, I, I don't like that. I yeah. don't want to operate like that. And I want to create an environment where <clears throat> anybody who's got uh, interest in doing research, they can come to this database that I've created and they can say, hey, okay, these are the data sets that we have. This is what I want to ask. And then boom, shoot it out. They, they can analyze it. You know, so to prevent people from doing all this stuff in silos, if we can coordinate this, you know, digitally, remotely, if if we can link people like myself together, mm -hmm. you know, who actually give a damn about solving the problem, yeah, then uh, I, I think people are going to be much better off. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's a great idea. I hope that that works out. Well, everybody's got a different role. That's just yeah. my small. Oh, that'd be. I mean conglomerating data like that and it being able to answer some and, 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 and correlate true data, yep. true data sets, that would be, that would be huge for the, for the community. I think, you know, um, it would, it would be a big impact, have a huge impact. Um, from your, in your experience, when, uh, you've got first responders and veterans coming in, how do you differentiate between simply coping with traumas that they have versus <laughs> like actually getting better and healing from there? Um, I, I think the, the easiest stereotype example would be um, somebody who's coping is drinking a lot. So if you think about veterans and uh, police obviously can't do drugs, so th their vice is uh, drinking. Right. So they may know something is wrong. They just don't understand it. So they don't like the way they're feeling. They don't like the emotion. So they're going to no. uh, take something in that um, alters that emotion and sort of makes them feel a little bit better. Mm -hmm. And with uh, one, of the, one of the biggest things or surprises to me, and again, it makes sense once you have the data, but um, their sleep, their, their sleep schedules are, are horrendous. And it, it plays a major part in that. And that's where sort of emotions come in. And, you know, sometimes they might stay up late, you know, thinking about, mm -hmm. you know, an event or something like that. So I think somebody who's, uh, what you said, coping and what? Versus actually healing from it. So I think healing, <clears throat> therapy is not the only solution. You know, just like we were taught, you know, prolonged exposure, EMDR, you know, there are multiple therapeutic approaches and that's one thing, but then you've also got mindfulness. You, you've got other things that, that they can do peer support. Peer support's a massive um, thing. And it, it, it appears to be one, one of the ways that they can, if they don't want to come into therapy, one of the ways that they can deal with stuff is dealing with the peer. So um, supervisors have um, gone through this training and they're sort of trained to spot, certain telltale signs, um, you know, for like suicide or, you know, drinking and, and, and things like that. Are there any, what are, what are those telltale signs? If you don't mind me interrupting what, uh, the, the typical ones. Uh, I mean, if, if, I mean, if you zoom out and you do the 30,000 foot view, right. um, you behaviors trump thoughts. And what I mean is, uh, if, if somebody's saying they're going to kill themselves, yes, that's extremely serious and that needs to be handled. Right. Um, but if, if somebody's saying like, you know, I got a gun, I just bought a gun, uh, last night I bought, I bought the ammo. It's under my, it's under my mattress. I'm going to go home and I'm going to end, end my life. Well, they've taken behavioral steps to go ahead and, and start this process. So somebody like that, the, the, you need to get real spooked and you need to get real concerned when something like that um, happens. Um, so, some of the ones they're, they're giving away um, items. Mm. And it, th this is why suicide research is so tricky. The VA has thrown tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars to ad address this. They, they have a, uh, a yearly, an annual report that, that they put out. And the one they had uh, was in November last year, and they looked at uh, suicides from 2001 to 2021 and went from like 6,000 to like 6,392. And that's a 6% jump. So they throw all this money at this, and they've come up with ingenious and innovative ideas, but the damn thing is still risen 6%. Hmm. So maybe you could argue, well, we've been our op operational tempo, constant deployments. 
Well, well, I don't know. Right. You know, right, right. maybe six good, but I look at it and I'm like, well, you know, one's too many. So that 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 shows the complexity of you know th- 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 this process. Mm-hmm. They I think it was last year they they had like a 25 million dollar um grant, you know, so like everybody threw in, you know, their their best ideas and the VA evaluated them. We didn't get it, but the ones who the the ones who did get funding, it's absolutely brilliant and innovative, you know. But we, how much will that move the the, the marker? I don't know. Mm. So you've got these telltale signs, but you've also got people who are real stealth about it. Who <clears throat> maybe they just they don't say anything. Um, uh, when 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 they're in active duty, I'm going. The, I guess I'm going several years ago. I, I I think I read something that, you know, of, of the people that are most likely that they, that they would. So if somebody dies by suicide, then you do like a psychological autopsy and you reconstruct and you try to identify the patterns. What was it that, you know, led to the, you know, led to this outcome. And uh, sometimes they only tell their significant other. Sometimes it's a, a guy in their unit. So it it's it it it's different for everybody, but you do have people who don't say a damn thing about it, right. and it's a complete surprise. Right. So, uh, which goes back to what you were saying: the importance of the peer groups, yep. having having that group of of one or two, one confidant that you can you know feel comfortable enough to kind of share with. But it has to be genuine. Right. Right. Um, it can't be felt forced or told. Share with me, please. Share with me. It's got to come from them. Right. <laughs> Well, you know, I mean, like, like when uh, we'd get a safety brief, the arm, I love the army. It was the most wild time of my entire life. You know, so every, every Friday you get a briefing, Hey, don't, you know, don't do X, Y, and Z, you know? Um, or when you get back from deployment and the, uh, Sergeant major or whoever the leader of your group is, um, you can the, they are required, I think, to say, hey, you know, if you need help, you know, go do it. But what the individual, at least I could see, I could tell when it was like a genuine thing, you know, like I'm, I'm, you, you seriously need to go, you know, get it handled as opposed to somebody who is more lip service. They're just saying it to check the box and right, right. get out, you know, at four on Friday or something. Yeah, that makes sense. So it, it, it it's multifaceted. If I had... The answer, I'd be a, a rich man. <laughs> yeah, I think it's different for every person. I think, yeah, I'm trying to, uh, I, I would say to, in the case of veterans, uh, you know, I, I was talking about this with, with Jake yesterday, but the likelihood to want to share something when as a veteran and as a soldier, you're taught to be a protector and be a leader. Yep. The last thing, or an alpha, the last thing you want to do is show any kind of weakness. And so sharing that, is like show, showing vul- that vulnerability is the actual kind of the opposite of that. So there's this kind of stigma with not wanting to to share, which in the which actually contributes to the problem even more. Well, I'm I'm an extremely private person. This is the first time I've ever done anything li- like this, and I had to ask myself, you know, you know, pluses or minuses. Why do you, why do you want to do it? And for me, it was the greater good. Right. You know, th- this <clears throat> it. It really, I've got a mouth, so I'll try to watch it. Mm-hmm. Um, it. It really pisses me off because a lot of times this is preventable. You know, whether, whether it's somebody, you know, drinking too much or, <laughs> you know, somebody who, who wins their life. You, you can't save everybody, but you can save some. And it's preventable and we, we need to get this out to the people so that they can start to heal. Mm-hmm. And it it's it's multifaceted, but it's it's a pretty uh, um it, it's a hard it's a hard topic. Yeah, and, and yeah, and I had to justify to myself why the hell do I want to come on here, right. and I, I settled it because uh, for me, what waited you know more was 
you know, helping people. Yeah. So I'm, I'm a, I'm a behind the scenes guy. I'm a private guy. I don't do stuff like this. I appreciate it, man. But, but for me, the, the greater good, mm -hmm. you know, I never thought I'd be going back to the Middle East, but I'm willing to do it because it, it's helping people. I, I mean, I've, I've got my religious views. I can work with anybody of any faith. I can work with anybody of any, uh, you know, ethnicity, nationality, anything. It's it's all for the greater good. And it sort of comes back to the why. Why the hell are you doing this? And you need to be passionate about it because it's a lot of work and it's long freaking hours, mm -hmm. but it, it it's worth it. The reason I enjoy writing so much is because if if we write something up and it gets published, you're a counselor in Alaska. I don't, I don't know. Maybe you read something and you're working with a vet or a first responder and it's you know, you say one thing that makes them, you know, not harm themselves. You know, I'll, I'll never know that. Right. But it's it's going to happen. I I have no, I don't know where on God's earth it's going to happen or who's going to do it, but it's going to happen. And I think that's why this needs to get done in a systematic manner instead of people operating in silos. Yeah, I agree. I think that's great. And and taking on this is a big a big challenge is hard, uh, especially you know a lot of people who uh, need the most help right. are the one that are a lot of times the ones unwilling to make the change because you have to want to do that for yourself. And so how, how do you find that? How do you find that way to reach out to somebody who, you know, needs help, but has a hard time accepting it and want and wanting to make the change for themselves. Well, you just said that's that's the key. It's acceptance. Right. You know, are, are you are you willing to accept and tolerate having these emotions? Right. Or every time when they come up, you know, do you drink? Now, now maybe you have negative emotions and a healthy outlet is going to the gym and you're a gym rat. Right. That you know that that that's cool. So maybe changing habits, maybe changing their lifestyle and habits to maybe open up the perception, become more open-minded can help lead that path towards mindfulness and being open to suggestion and change. And, and cause at the end of the day, it's going to be their own choice for them to say, I want the, I'm done. I need to make a change. Right. Saying the, the one thing, you know, with addicts and alcoholics, it's like, you have to make that, that change at the end of the day, people can help you. They can walk you. They can say, please change. But you need to be the one that says, I need to do something about this. This is, this was it. This is the moment. And most, a lot of people know when that moment is like, this is the moment where it all shifted. So trying to help the people that you that you want to help and getting them that mindset to shift, that's the hard part, right? <laughs> getting them to shift and maybe, you know, again, cha changing the external factors, the physical factors in their life, whether it's like going to the gym, working out or, you know, change, you know, getting off social media, things that you have that are just things that you can do that can that can help alleviate and remove a lot of the clutter that can simplify things can maybe give somebody an open, a more open mind frame and mindset to be open to change, I guess. People don't change until they have to. The problem is that have to is extremely subjective. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Um, so, I mean, you, like you just in the last paragraph, you you know, you acceptance, my, you know, so you're, you're hitting all these things, social media, and people are out there researching what you're just saying. So I, I, I don't know the literature on, you know, Facebook and, or social media time and what that relationship is to drinking or something like that. Right. Um, but there are people out there doing it and they can look at that statistically. They can look at that qualitatively um, and they can, they can, they can glean information from that. Does that mm -hmm. make any sense? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, what do you think, your everyday person who may have a family member who's a first responder or um, a veteran and might be dealing with these issues or may not even have in their lives just to want to help. What, what can they do to help somebody directly that they know or indirectly with like through one tribe? Like what are some ways that somebody can get involved? We have, we have, uh, we do Q QPR trainings. That's question persuade and refer. So we go into some of these departments and we do, um, you know, a half day workshop, a couple hour workshop on if you encounter somebody who's suicidal, these are the do's, these are the don'ts. Um, so you have a lot of, uh, lay people, but also, uh, you know, anybody from principals to schools to teachers, you know, because yeah, we're talking about vets and first responders, but you know, this, this is, you know, a, a people issue, not just them. And 
Uh, so individually, they can sort of arm themselves with more knowledge. Mm. Um, what? What are sorry? What are those do's and don'ts? If you, do you what are those? Yeah, uh, you you never leave. So th there there's a big myth. If we talk about suicide, you're going to be more likely to do it. That's null and void. That's not reality. So um, people people sometimes don't even ask because it may it's uncomfortable for them. So you, you need to ask, and then you need to assess. Well, okay, do you have a plan? What are your thoughts? You, you know, how far are you along on that spectrum? Like we were talking about, have you already bought the the bullets? Have you already bought the you know the uh, the, the weapon weapon system. Um, so you, you, you've got that, but then, uh, you never, ever, ever leave them alone. So, you know, this is drilled into, uh, mental health, uh, clinicians, you know, if, if somebody's suicidal or something like that, you don't just end the session and out, there they go. Um, you, you keep them there. You do like a safety plan. You, uh, you, you let them know that there are, uh, options out there. And I, I, I think this is where the why comes in, you know, so we can give endless examples of uh, family members, extended family, in-laws, you know, who, who, who have uh, died by suicide, but people just don't ask. They don't like making themselves uncomfortable. Mm. So they can go to some of these trainings that, that we offer. Um, we have uh, the peer support. Um, the, the reason why the peer, the peer support is big for uh, first responders, but it's especially police, is um, you can have the supervisor who's trained to look out to these things. And the, the research is pretty clear that you're more likely to tell somebody sort of of your own rank. You know, so if I've been there five years, I'm not going to go talk to the chief. Maybe I talk to my, uh, you know, uh, my partner who's in the squad car, or maybe I uh, talk to my immediate supervisor. But it's somebody who's who, who's got the basics, who they know not to leave you alone. They know what to ask. They know what not what to not ask. And then you do a warm handoff to, you know, the next level of care. Mm -hmm. um, so it. It's it's a pretty rudimentary thing, right? Um, but personally, what what I need, so my, my my goal for the last two years has been this court program. Um, going there, I, the, the judge's background again. He was a ten year uh, police officer. Put him through, put himself through law school. Was a car, one promotion away from a brigadier general. Wow. You know, it, it, it's like almost what... What, what haven't you done? Yeah, exactly. I got a buddy like that who's I went to high school, grew up with. He's like a an MD, a pharmacist, a, a MBA, and a maybe a lawyer. I'm not sure what the last Damn. one. But yeah, he's just school, study, school, study, school, school, school. Yeah. We, we need to uh, broaden and build. And we need to... If anybody's out there listening, if there are any other first responders, if there are... Uh, any brass is there if there's any if anybody's listening who's got any pull who could start to make waves in, in their local county or their local jurisdiction they they can reach out um, to me they can reach out to the court and you know hopefully we can start a conversation to move this forward because we've already uh, the article we wrote up it's under review right now but uh, unequivocally the program works it's just like uh, the veteran one. Mm -hmm. Um, so getting the message out on that, I mean, you've got 3,100 counties in the, in the States mm -hmm. and you've only got one. And what's the name of the court so that people can it look it up? It is the public safety employees treatment court. Okay. And I'll put the information contact info yeah, on, absolutely. On, in, um, in the link. So the, 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 the judge is great. I mean, it's, it's very informal. Anybody can go look. It's a public docket. Um, he, he sort of just, if, if there's, I don't know the number, let's just say there's 15, 20 people. It's uh, okay. You know, these five, there's been some issues, stand up, question, you know, what's going on, yada, yada, yada. Then he goes to the people. Oh, okay. You've completed all these tasks. Awesome. You get, you know, you get promoted to the next level. Um, so for me, I'm still passionate about that. We need to expand that because again, does that look different for Fort Worth, Texas, as opposed to Jackson, Mississippi or Atlanta, Georgia? We, we just don't know, know yeah. until we have the data. Right. Um, so that's for me personally, that's bullet point one. Bullet point two is, well, maybe there's three. Um, so uh, bullet point two is 
I want to um, create a task force or a database of where people like me uh, who have data, they can opt in. Mm-hmm. So you, you've, you've got these tenure track professors who need to publish to, to you know, get promoted. Th- this is perfect for them because the hardest thing to do is get access to like a data and, right. and run numbers. So here it is. So um, I've, I've, I, I, I don't really give a damn if, if they have veteran background or first responder background, doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. You know, if, if you've got a strong passion for it, I want to hear from you. Mm-hmm. I want to know uh, what your story is and I want, I want to get this ball moving. So the, the next probably two, three, four, five years, you know, of, of my life, this, this is my small country. Everybody's got theirs. This is my small contribution. I, I want to stand up, uh, and ent- I don't know if it's an LLC task force. I have no idea what it sort of looks like. So I'm sort of just, you know, uh, rolling with it. But right. the, the idea is to system be systematic about everything. And, um, I need people who can do super advanced, uh, statistics. Mm -hmm. Um, I I can interpret and run some rudimentary stuff, but, but the stuff that I was talking about earlier, like the network analysis, things like that, I need people who can run that. Mm -hmm. And, um, I I need them on standby because I've already got too many data sets that I don't know what to do with. Right. So I've got to be very judicious with, you know, what you know what i'm doing and why i'm doing it right and then compile them to some sort of online database compiling those two you having the the, exactly, the yeah. coding the coding knowledge to do that as well for exactly sure. but yeah that would be a huge and how, how can people reach out to you and, and contact you uh it's real hard my my uh email address is warren at one tribe org. the one is the number so totally. warren at, i can give you i'll put the link there as well <laughs> um and, and you mentioned also we were, talk, we were talking about earlier about p- people joining uh uh, groups to be able to, to, to spot out vict- yep. uh, people who might be, how can people uh, sign up to join, to, to, to They can go to our website and there's a form they can fill out or they can email me and I can pass it along internally. Okay. Um, Cause we, we, we do have people who, who's really that sole job is, you know, and, and for, for, for me, every time I think about slowing down, mm-hmm. something happens. So, even just in DFW in the last month, you've had like what, two or three officers get shot. One died, mm-hmm. you know, the Dallas guy, uh, guy and he, he, he was like a teacher and he wanted to serve his community, just got out of, uh, the Academy and he gets, you know, yeah. killed. So, so you, you've, you've got that. Um, and the, and then the, the kids, um, for, for, for me, this is a very, 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 uh, important thing. We, one of the programs that we have is watch it's called, we are the children of heroes. And it's, um, it's about for kids and widows who have had a vet dive by suicide or get killed in the line of duty. Um, I'll, I'll make the statement vague so nobody can tie it in with one person vet or first responder as well. First response. Yep. Or, okay. Okay. Um, there, there, there was a, an end of, there was a, a child who, whose father uh, was a police officer and got killed. And when she went to school, like the, you know, the following week after it happened, uh, they said, uh, one of the students went up to her and said, you know, your dad's a pig. I'm, I'm glad he's dead. So it's messed up. Man. That's the type of shit that sticks with me. Yeah. And I, I, my, my office, it's, I'm not the most organized person, but you know, when you go out in the hallway, there's a, there's a wall and the wall has pictures of everybody that, that has died by suicide. It, it's got their picture. We've got a little digital thing that tells you what, you know, what their story was. So this is having a massive impact on the, the, you know, the individual, the widow and the family system. Right. And that's why this is so important because we can, to some degree, we can prevent this, you know, and I want, I, 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 I need to slow. This is for my personal life as well. I need to slow down in, in certain aspects and, and enjoy it. But, you know, at work, this, this is why it pisses me off. 
And why I get so, you know, upset and passionate about it is because, uh, you know, th these are the stories we're hearing. This is, this is what reality is. Right. So if there's something that we can do to reduce their suffering, then, then that's what we do. Yeah. You know, so the, the court is bullet point one of what I need. Bullet point two is, uh, I need people, uh, who can help me do the research. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then, uh, the, the third one is the, you know, for the EMDR article that, you know, I, I, I was telling you about, uh, we, it, it was three people. I did the, you know, the, it was a mixed methods. They filled out questionnaires and they did a qualitative interview. Uh, what I need, if there's any um, licensed mental health professionals out there, um, I would love it if if they reach out because uh, the data set I have is clinical and it has massive clinical application. And this is specific to EMDRs, more specific. Well, yeah, uh, yes, because I for the next step of the the evolution of researching that, mm -hmm. I've got like ten thousand things going concurrently you know, uh, forward. And th that's one of them mm -hmm. is, uh, anybody who's been trained in EMDR, who's a, you know, a licensed clinician, um, that that's what I need. Uh, I need, I need to hear from. Mm -hmm. That's great. Thanks for sharing all this information. And yeah, I think that people don't realize also the, the effect, I mean, it's the effect that losing a family member to it can, can, can affect, but in the case of such a story of that girl who's, who dealt with, you know, some bully at school saying something like that, can you a, imagine? Yeah, I, I, I can't even imagine first having to deal with that as a kid, like without somebody even saying something like that, having yeah. to deal with the loss of a parent, especially given this, given the situation and then have somebody say something like that, just having a community or an outreach that, that, that kid can, that that girl can have to realize how outrageous <laughs> something like that is to, because a lot of kids don't realize that when they think that that's the truth when they hear that, yep. especially as a kid, they're like, Oh my, he was a pig. Like, and they, they take that to heart and they're like, they, they question it, but to have that community and, and, and people around to, to make her understand that there's assholes out there. There's even, and a lot of times they can be assholes that are kids that don't even know that they're being assholes or, or people who are really malevolent and actually believe these things, regardless of what the reasons are, you need to know that you have a support system of people that, and the majority of people who are sane on this earth, I hope so are there to help this, this girl to, to, to make her understand that we're not like that. Well, even this past weekend, um, uh, Buck Kern, he's the one who, uh, he did snowball express, um, for, I can't even remember. Uh, but, but nonetheless, th this last week, uh, this last weekend, they had an event in Dallas mm -hmm. and all these people like this, they flew in, they bonded with each other. So we're, we're trying to create a, a community where they can, lean upon because i mean if you hearken back you know 50 years to the, to the vietnam vets mm. they they it, they were basically they got taught don't say anything hold it within right and that's what this you know that's what these kiddos could be taught so if you've already lost a parent you know to an extreme thing like that's traumatic enough mm -hmm. but when you when when you put on top of that the societal the, 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 the culture wars that, that we're dealing with, you know, right. and I'm, I'm deliberately staying away from the politics, right. but, but, but from the, from, from the, a mental health point of view, right. it, it's a cesspool of like everything you don't want to happen. Right. Because again, like I go back to what I was saying earlier, if you are, if you believe because of whatever outside factors, whether it's media, social media, news, whatever it is, the, where the, the social climate, if you truly believe that a large majority of the people think that you, your existence, your job, your, what you've done, what, you, what you're doing for society is useless and you're not contributing to it. And you're suffering because of that. The last thing you're going to want to do is to speak up about how you're feeling. Cause you're going to feel like, Oh, this doesn't warrant even warrant my, my voice because I'm a fraud because people hate what I do. This feeling of ostracized, being ostracized from society. So that prevents people from coming out in the first, from coming up. Not only, not only do they, are they dealing with more trauma because of this feeling of sense of, of devalued sense of self-worth, but then coming out and speaking out about it is even harder to do. Yeah. And I mean, if you're taught that from a young age. True, that's you. I, I mean, <laughs> even if you, you know, you're at 18, 19, 20 year old and you come back from, from Vietnam, that's hard enough. Yeah. But if, if, if you're a kiddo, you know, so like you were saying, I've got kids, you've got youngsters, you know, with, with, if they had to deal with something like that, 
I, I don't think I personally as a kiddo would have been able to, that would have sent my life on a much different tra- trajectory than, yeah. you know, it's ended up becoming. And th- that's, that's why I can't let up. I, you've got to keep grinding. You've got to keep your feet moving. You've, you've got to keep doing that, yeah. you know, and that, that, that's why I agreed to do that. Like Jake, he's like, ah, I know this guy, go talk to him. Right. All right, cool. <laughs> you, you know, but, but, this is a, a a platform and if if i have to beat the drum fine i don't give a damn yeah. you know it, it's it's worth it you know um so so yeah the you know the uh i just need more people who who can help whether it whether it's you know an analyst uh, somebody who can write or somebody who just has connect maybe somebody has connections with an Oklahoma City Police Department we can do a you know a project there Right. You know, so it it's all about, you know, sort of connecting things in an integ- integrated way. That's great, man. Well, thank you so much for coming. I appreciate you, you coming here and making that decision to come because I think it's going to help a lot of people. And I think I think you've helped me, too. So <laughs> speaking selfishly, I appreciate it, man. Thanks so much. Yes, I appreciate it. <laughs>